and there's a kind of combination of, um, I don't know, exchange of uh, knowledge and legitimization for um, funding and for career opportunities and uh, important mission, things like that. So let me find here, I want to go back to um, World War I, a very famous psychologist, um, Robert Yerkes, he was involved in the early intelligence tests. He was also president of the APA in 1917. So he calls together the APA council. Gentlemen, there were only men there, right? Our knowledge and our methods are of importance to the military service of the country, and it is our duty to cooperate to the fullest extent. Well, the council was divided, but Yerkes was able to maneuver behind, in, uh, behind the scenes and get the APA to go along and put all its services in the hands of military. The military didn't know what to do with them, they didn't quite want them at that time, but they made themselves very useful. And Yerkes himself, he designed the Arm Army Alpha Intelligence Test. And what that did is it sorted out a million recruits for job assignments, okay? This was no easy matter. How do you sort out, how do you sort out people? So here we see already the sort of exchange of knowledge for you know, with career opportunities and so on. Um, after World War II, I'm, I'm going to pass over all the wonderful things the social psychologists did in World War II. After World War II, uh, the Army Human Resources Section Chief persuaded a psychologist named Meredith Crawford to found the Human Resources Research Organization, that's Humro, you may have heard that name, to continue psychological research for the Army. Now, why didn't the Army just do it in-house? Why have they got it out there over, I um, can't remember whether it was George Washington or Georgetown University at the time. Fundamentally, you can't do science in a situation where there's secrecy and obedience, right? It collapses on itself. So you need always to be in exchange with the, the Civic Center, science in the Civic Center. You may draw in the big names to do some undercover research for you, but basically it has to go back and forth if you lose the science. So Crawford founded it. He also was the treasurer of APA for 10 years. The president is not the power person. The treasurer is the power person, okay? President comes in and goes in one year. The treasurer is there for five years at a time. So he was the one who took AP out of some little brownstone in Washington, D.C., and they have two huge, huge, you know, multi-million dollar buildings right now, okay? And so he was at Humro for 25 years, uh, and later on, after being treasurer, he headed the AP, uh, APA Office of Accreditation, okay? That's very powerful for legitimization, and so on. So Humro people have continued to have leadership roles and been very influential uh, at the APA. So this is, a, this is a kind of tradition, and we could say that there are some wonderful things about it and there are some very doubtful things about it, and it's probably pretty hard for anybody to draw the line, and the APA has not been able to draw the line. That's what our fight has been about. Um, after 9-11, in the wake of 9-11, the board of directors of APA discussed the conference, discussed the terrorist attacks in a conference call the next week. Okay, they're on top of it with, on top of it with uh, national defense stuff. So they networked with psychologists who were working in mission-critical government departments such as defense and state and the FBI. They co-sponsored uh, invitation-only conferences with these people and said basically, what can we do for you? So that was how it got started, it was getting started. 